Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Shaurya Singhal from IIT Rukhi, and this is my course project for the course DA201 Applied Clean Algebra. And for the course project, I'm doing a video PPT on the topic pseudo inverse. So let's get straight into it. So let's first talk about what is the agenda of this lecture charge video PPT. So by the end of this video PPT, you should be answered able to answer the following questions. What is the pseudo inverse? What is the significance and the use of the pseudo inverse? We will also go over what, to, what is the method to find the pseudo inverse and what are its limitations rendered off. So uh, let's first start by defining what is a normal inverse or the so-called inverse. Uh, we have all done as I'm expecting, we have all done this in our syllabus for before 12th. So let's start by defining it again. The inverse for any matrix A is defined by this symbol. And when we multiply it with the matrix, no matter from which side, it gives us the identity. So what are the conditions for this inverse to exist? First, the matrix must be square. Second. The matrix must be non singular, that is, the determinant of A is non zero. So, before we start talking about the pseudo inverse, uh, let's talk about why are we talking about the pseudo inverse. So, this takes back to the inverse problem. Given a system of linear equations, Ax equals to B, where we are given A and B, and we have to solve for X. The way to solve these equations by the normal inverse would be to multiply the inverse from left on both sides. And this will give us the identity matrix and the identity matrix multiplied by any vector is the vector itself. And this is the solution. So limitations of solving it this way. First of all, what if the A matrix A isn't a square matrix? Second, what if the matrix A is singular? So that's where the pseudo inverse comes in. So the pseudo inverse. So the pseudo inverse is the generalization of the inverse for any matrix A, whether it be square or non square. M necessarily might not be equal to M. And uh, the formula for the pseudo inverse is the following. We multiply A by its transpose, take the inverse of that and multiply it by the transpose. So why is this formula important? Well, first of all, it gets rid of the square problem because A transpose A is always square for any matrix A with dimensions n cross n. Say we have a matrix A with dimensions n cross n, then the dimensions of A transpose will be N cross M. And the dimensions of A transpose A is N cross M. That is, it's always square. No matter the dimensions of the matrix. Given. Second, if we were to multiply this on left to both sides to the inverse problem, as you can see, the left side gives us the identity matrix again when we solve it and uh, we get the answer to the system of linear equations and the inverse. Okay, so a question for thought. What if the, since the pseudo inverse is a matrix and when we multiply the pseudo inverse by A, it gives us the identity matrix, shouldn't the inverse of a square matrix always exist? What I mean by this is that when we define the normal inverse, we said that a matrix is only defined for a square matrix and it only exists when A is non-singular. But what if A is singular? What if A is singular? Then the matrix shouldn't, the inverse shouldn't exist. But as we have seen that the pseudo inverse is a matrix and when we multiply it by the matrix itself, it gives us the identity matrix. So shouldn't the matrix all 
showing the inverse of any of a square matrix always exists, even when it's singular. So I will encourage you to pause the video and think about this for a few seconds before I show you the answer. On to the answer. So the answer is, uh, well, it's because A transpose A is not always invertible. In fact, we can prove the fact that rank of A transpose A is always equal to the rank of A, which means A transpose A is only invertible when A has full rank, which also means that A is invertible. Let's try and prove this. So, given a matrix A with dimensions F plus N, we will be using the rank nullity theorem. Which states that for any matrix A, the rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A should be equal to the number of columns in A. So let X be any vector belonging to the null space of A. Then by the rank, then we can say that by the definition of the null space that AX A should be equal to the zero vector. Now multiplying by A transpose on both sides from the left should give us something like this. The RHS will again be the zero vector now. So it's any matrix multiplied by the zero vector is the zero vector. And as we can see, we have gotten the result that A transpose into A into X is equal to the zero vector. This means that X should belong to the null space of A transpose. So what we've proved here is that for any vector X belonging to the null space of A, it should also belong to the null space of A transpose A, that is. The null space of A is a subset of the null space of A. Why is it a subset? Uh, because we haven't talked about what if a vector exists in the null space of A transpose A, will it always exist in the null space of A as well? So start by defining that. Let X be a vector in the null space of A transpose A. Then we can write the following. Let's multiply by X transpose from the left on both sides. Now, what is this? This is just the dot product of a vector AX. That is, this is just the dot product of a vector B, where B is equal to X. Since the dot product of a vector itself can only be zero when the vector is the zero vector, we can say that AX must be this. That is, X belongs to the null space of A. So we have proved that if a vector belongs to the null space of A transpose A, it should also belong to the null space of A. That is, the null space of A transpose A, the subset of X. By this and the result we proved before, we can say that the null space of A is equals to the null space of A transpose. Since this is a dimension of M cross N and the dimension of this whole matrix is N cross N, the number of columns in A is also equals to the number of columns in A transpose. So by the rank nullity theorem, we can say that the rank of A should also be equal to the rank of A transpose. Hence, uh, we also said that uh, if that A transpose A will only be invertible when the A has full rank, what does that mean is that that is the null space of dimension of null space of A will be zero. That is, we don't have any non-zero eigenvalue in A. Since the determinant of A is the product of the eigenvalues, that will be non-zero as well. So A is always non-secretor. And thus, we have proved the result. So let's move on. 
<clears throat> so what does it mean when AS full rank? You have to also define that. So moving on. So in these cases, when in the cases when A isn't full rank, an exact answer might not exist. And if it does exist, there are infinite solutions because of all the free variables. Since when the when A is in full rank, in the equation AX equals to B, X has free variables. X has free variables. So because of the free variables, if a solution exists, there will be infinite of them. And if it doesn't exist, then there will be no solution. So what does this mean is that in the equation AX equals to B, if B belongs to the span of A, then there will be infinite solutions. And if B doesn't belong to the span of A, then there will be no solution. So what does the student verse do when we are dealing with these cases. When dealing with the no solution case, the pseudo inverse gives us the vector which minimizes the error defined as ax minus b. Since there is no solution, it will give us the closest answer to b, which is the best possible fit and the best possible answer to b. And when there are infinite solutions, so that is there are infinite x, then it will give us the x having the minimum L2 norm. So that is, we minimize the, that just the answer minimizes the L2 norm of X, which is just the square of the elements in the vector X. So it will give us the answer having the minimum L2 norm. And here we will have an exact answer. That is AX will be equals to B. So X we get will definitely be equal to B. So let's try and prove these results. Proof. Let's first of all take the case when B doesn't belong to the span of A. That is, we have no such equations. Uh, let's define R to be the residue, and this will be And this will be equals to ax minus b. That is the error we are getting when we are solving the linear equations ax equals to b. Okay. And we will define an objective function that is the transpose of the residual multiplied by itself. And we will try to minimize the phi that is minimize the error. Phi can be written as x minus b transpose x minus b. So phi can be written as x transpose a transpose a x minus b transpose a x minus x transpose a transpose b minus plus b transpose b. Since this is a scalar value and this is the transpose of that this scalar value. We can just add these up together. Now our objective was to minimize phi. That is the objective. So what we do is that we take the derivative of phi with respect to x and we set it as zero. So this will give us the first term is a square in x. So we will have two here. A transpose ax minus two. A transpose. See here, x cancels out and we take the transpose of this. Since it's a square, we add a two and we take the transpose of this coefficient of x for the sake of defining it as a column. And then we can just write this as a transpose b. And mm -hmm. 
and get the pseudo inverse we mentioned before. So let's go over this again. We define the residual, which is the error we are getting when we're solving for x in the linear equation ax equals to b. And we define the objective function as the square, or as maybe you can say the S2 norm of R. And we minimize that objective function. When we minimize that objective function, we're also minimizing R, which is the error in our answer. And as you can see, when we minimize it, what we get is the pseudo inverse itself. So this proves that if an answer doesn't exist, then pseudo inverse gives us the best answer. And if it does exist, the pseudo inverse will give us the exact answer. Now let's talk about the case when P belongs to span of A. Uh, of course, when we are talking about A here, we are assuming that A isn't full rank. So this means that there will be infinite solutions because of free vehicles. So we will change up the objective function a bit and we will add a new term, the L2 norm of X divided by two plus lambda into the residual. And we will try to minimize this. The minimizing phi here will be equivalent to minimizing the L2 norm of X and also minimizing the error on X. So as you can see, if we minimize this, we should get an answer that will be an exact fit if an answer exists for the residual, that is the residual will be equals to zero and it if there are multiple answers, it will give us the one where X is minimized. That is the L2 norm of X is minimized. So let's minimize this. We'll write two equations to minimize this and solve. <clears throat> so. Solving this first. We get x plus lambda. Write this equation. Transpose x by two plus lambda a x plus b. Transpose. So taking that two and two should cancel out. This and uh, we will get x, b will become 0, and lambda transpose a will become a transpose lambda. For the solve this, we get minus a transpose lambda. And now solving del phi of del lambda equals to 0, get ax minus b in this way equals to 0. ax would be equals to b. it back we get put this in here we get a transpose b that is lambda three is to minus a transpose b and now finally putting this back into here you can see we get plus a transpose Now, the first question you might be having is that this isn't the same formula as we defined before. So I will give you like a few seconds to think about it. Why? You can pause the video and think about it before I tell you why or is it the same formula as before. So moving on on the answer. Uh, if you notice in this equation right here, if we multiply on both sides, what do we get? You would have guessed these when these cancel out and we get ax to b. So yes, this is uh this is also the pseudo inverse. Why does it have a different formula? Is because this time around 
instead of multiplying the pseudo inverse from the left, we, the pseudo inverse was multiplied to A from the right. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we taking the right inverse? It, why are we also defining the right inverse? The answer for this lies in the fact of why, what happens when we have infinite solutions. As you might know, that when we have infinite solutions, it implies that the number of variables is greater than the number of equations. That is, we have three variables. Come here and we multiply a and x. What does this mean? Now, x is our set of variables and a is our set of equations of when we multiply n x, we take the dot product of this row with this. So in A, the columns define the number of variables. And the rows define the number of equations. When we have three variables in X, that means that the that we have extra variables compared to the number of equations. That is, the number of variables is greater than the number of equations. So, ah. also to say this, we have to say, uh, when I say that A is full rank, what does it mean? It means that A has a rank equals to minimum of M cob I. That is, what if we have a case where the number of columns is greater than the number of rows? Then A must be at least, for A to be full rank, it must be equals to M. So in this case, as you can see, since n is greater than m, the number of vary, number of equations, that is, as equations are represented by rho, is less than the number of variables. And in this case, instead of multiplying x from the right and operating on the columns, what we do is that instead of multiplying the inverse from the right and operating on the columns, when the column doesn't have full rank, the rows do. We multiply A from the right instead of the left. So that is why a right inverse exists because we have three variables and we don't have full column rank, but we do have full row rank. So the right inverse helps in that situation. So back onto the topic. So we have proven that if an, if an unique answer exists, the in pseudo inverse will give us that answer. And if, uh, a unique answer doesn't exist, then we have two cases. So, yeah. So, to summarize, pseudo inverse is the generalization of the inverse, which allows us to define an inverse even when a matrix isn't a square matrix, which is a plus point. When multiplying from the left, the pseudo inverse has this form. And when multiplying from the right, the pseudo inverse has this form. We understood that multiplying from the right helps us in cases when the matrix has full row rank, but doesn't have a full column rank. When solving the system of linear equations AX equals to B, if a unique solution exists, then it gives us that exact solution. If there are infinite solutions, it gives us the one with the minimum L2 norm for X. And actually in these four cases, we can say that the x we get, if we multiply it back with a, we'll definitely get. 
but if there is no solution then the pseudo inverse will give us the answer with the least error what does it mean is that the x we get from the pseudo inverse formula if we put it back into the equation a x equals to b then multiplying a with x will not give us b but a value close to b or at least the answer close is possible to b with the matrix now visualization might help actually in the case of no solution imagine we have a matrix a of the form what series Now the span of this matrix, if we were to define, is the xy plane. Span of this matrix is the xy plane. Now let b be a vector, one comma one comma one. So this will like go out of the plane, right? Take this to the positive. Let's put it minus one. So. Now, as we know that since the span of uh, our matrix A is the xy plane, it can't, uh, whenever we multiply any vector x with x, we'll always get a vector in this space. And we can't get any vector out of this space. So that means that B doesn't belong to the span of. So what does the student verse does here? The student verse will give us an answer minus one, one, and zero. That is the x we get if we multiply it with a again. The b we get, the new b, will be this. That is the closest possible answer in the span of a to the vector b. So that's what it means to be the closest possible answer. So now we have covered the theory of a pseudo inverse. I hope you can answer the first question of what is a pseudo inverse and was it what is its use. We'll talk about the significance later with the limitations. Now moving on to the method of how to find a pseudo inverse. So we will go about this in th three steps. We'll first define the method. Then we will look over at the examples and we will go over the algorithm in paper not in code, I will leave that as a task for you to do by yourself. Okay, so let's first now define the method to find the pseudo inverse. By the way, the sign for pseudo inverse is this A with this cross notations. So how do we find it? It calls you use something known as singular value decomposition. So, or commonly known as SVD. So, using SVD, what can we say? Using SVD, we can break down any matrix A, whether it be square, non square, singular, non singular, any matrix A, into the product of u sigma and v transpose, where u and v are orthogonal matrices. And sigma is a diagonal matrix. So, uh, First of all, let's remember what the orthogonal matrix means. It means that the inverse of the matrix is equals to its transpose, similar for V. And the diagonal matrix means is that only the diagonal elements are non-zero and all the other parts of the matrix are zero. So inverse for this matrix will come used in later. So I will just define it right here. Uh, as you can see that uh, the inverse for this matrix will just be the reciprocal of the diagonal elements. Why? Well, since sigma, sigma inverse should be equal to i, if we just multiply this with this, as you can see, all the diagonal elements cancel out and all the other elements are zero anyway, so we get the identity matrix. So, 
So, uh, why are we talking about SVD and why does it relate to the students? Let's try and define that. So, formula broke down for student was four. Now, uh, let's use that formula. So, we will write A as its SVD. And we will take the transpose of that and write it as A transpose. So that will just be B sigma B transpose. Oops. Now, since V U is orthogonal, this will be equals to the identity matrix. So this becomes sigma square B transpose inverse B sigma U transpose. Now since V is also orthogonal, we can directly solve for this inverse and say that this will be equals to V sigma inverse, sigma inverse, V inverse, which is just V transpose multiplied by V sigma U transpose. So will just be, since this is V is orthogonal, this will be equals to the identity matrix. So we can just write this all this is. And finally, this also cancels out. So get this. So this is our final pseudo inverse. V into the inverse of the diagonal matrix, which is just the reciprocal of the diagonal elements as we have defined before, into your transpose. So using this. We can write an algorithm to find the pseudo inverse for any matrix A. And also this is the uh that also this is one of the methods to find the pseudo inverse by hand as well. If you want to find the pseudo inverse, there are generally speaking, there are two ways. Either find A transpose A, invert it. First, A transpose A, invert it, get A transpose A inverse, and then just multiply by A transpose. Now, problems with this method are, first of all, what if A transpose A is an invertible? A transpose A isn't invertible then in those cases, what do we do? So this is why using the SVD method is better because in those cases, we can just write A as V sigma Q transpose. Okay. And this will allow us to find the answer no matter what situation we are in. Now a question might be coming to your mind is what if sigma has zero entries? In fact, I should write this as as zero diagonal entries. Then what if we have a diagonal like this having value zero? In those case, taking a reciprocal of zero is not defined. When we try to find the inverse of the tag matrix in SVD. So, uh, I, I don't think it's better if I just tell you the answer for this question. I will try to give you a bit of an intuition about this. We will go and go into the exact details of it, but I will give you an intuition about it. So, why? How? Oh. Well, the answer is just straightforward to just is only take the reciprocal, reciprocate only the non zero entries.
and leave the zero entries as it is. Leave the zero entries as zero in sequence. Now, why do we do this and how does it work? I will give you an intuition about it. Uh, to give an intuition, let's talk about first, what does an SVD do intuitively? Given the SVD of any matrix A, when we multiply it by a matrix X, we're giving X as an input to A, and what it does is that it first, it rotates it, which is the job of the U matrix. Then it scales it, job of the sigma matrix, and then it rotates it again, job of the V matrix. And then we get P as the output. That is the X equals to B. Now, if we have zero entries in uh, this, this matrix, the diagonal matrix, then what does it mean? It means that a vector component in X just disappears. Appears for P. So vector component in X will just disappear for P. And that means that, well, it isn't really relevant. If it's going to disappear anyways, it isn't really relevant to our talk anyways. Because B has no information about it anyway. So why do we need it? For example, if let's say A is a matrix like this, and B is 2, 3, 0, then just write out our straight the solution by the pseudo inverse. We get 2, 3, 0. But if we use any vector 2, 3, C, where C belongs to real number, then AX will give the B matrix right here. So this will have a zero entry in sigma. And even though it has that entry, it isn't really relevant to B because the value here just disappears. So that's why just leaving the zero entries as it is, is the right thing to do. So that is why do this. Hope it's clear. Now on to the next part. We have to find the methods to find the student rules. Now we will go over an example, uh, the example will be easy since when finding the SPD, we also need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a matrix. So, sample for the method. So, we'll take matrix A, simple matrix, 2 cos 3, try to find. So, the first step find the singular value. Data. What does it involve? We first find A A transpose. This comes out to be four zero seven. Now find the eigenvalues A A transpose, which as you can see straight away, probably at this zero. And four. We also find so okay, first first let's uh so the eigenvalues of A transpose A gives us the singular values. 
which is just the square root of lambdas, which is zero bacteria. And the eigenvectors corresponding to these will just be a minus lambda i x equals to zero. And then we just solve for x and to get u. u. u should come out to be, as you will see, you will be two cross two pay such. Yeah. So this is you. Now we do the same for A transpose A to get to B and V will come out to B. The transpose of V so we made another mistake finding eigenvalues is really hard, especially when you can get uh, yeah. So the SVD comes out to be. Entity matrix multiplied by sigma. We have already found the sigma values. Just write them. We ignore the third singular value, of course. In uh, non square cases, usually speaking, the extra singular values will always be zero when sigma has to be non square, as in this case, three cross. Ah. We will define A, the SPD of A. This will just be 0, 0, 1, which is RU. Sigma, which A, in this case will be just be. Notice that we in SPD, the third single value that we would have found from A transpose A is not there. That is because in SPD, the third single value in cases of non square matrix, the extra single values. Yeah, are usually just zero. Actually, always zero. So, since we transpose, if you multiply these, as you can see, you will get back. You will get back a. So, finding the student inverse, just be sigma inverse. U transpose. Here it's just P sigma inverse. We will reciprocal half and we will leave zero as it is, and everything else is zero. Only the diagonals. You don't need to worry about the diagonals. Taking the transpose of U, which is this, and we get the pseudo inverse to be equals to. So when taking the inverse, if sigma is non square, just transpose it. So you had sigma, of course, since sigma into sigma inverse equals to i. If this is two cos three, then three has to be there, three cos two. So uh, this will give us 
uh, our student was, which will just be come back to A. A was a two cos three matrix. So its inverse will be a three cross two matrix in this case. Sorry. Since we are talking about the left inverse here, which gets multiplied from the left hand side. Okay, this is two cross three, this will be three cross two. So this is our student inverse. And as you can see, if I multiply it by this. end up getting it's not the identity matrix as of course since a is not invertible that is a doesn't have there is no full rack so this is not an exact inverse so this will give, end us giving end up giving us not the exact identity matrix but an approximation for this so uh, if you had a system of linear equations where A was equals to this matrix right here, and, and B was equals to, let's say, 1, 0. We solve here with this. Two. Uh, zero, 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 zero. Six. Let's just move this to zero. It's just one, zero, and zero. So, since we are since B belongs to span of A and A isn't full rank, as we defined before, we are in the infinite section. So we substitute this by any real value here in which we are seeing, we will always have an answer. But as we talked before, it gives us the minimum L2 norm X solution, which is if X was equals to X1, X2, and X3, then we minimize X1 square plus X2 square plus X3 square which in this case, since first value is fixed, take this to be any B or C value, any real value. So of course, this must be equals to zero and this must be equals to zero to minimize this. So as you can see, the student inverse gave us the minimum right to norm solution. And how did we find the student inverse? The method to find it. So that's over for the example. Now the final step of the question, the algorithm. We won't go over the exact code for it. I will leave it to as a sign to do on your own. Uh, since some people might be well versed in algorithms, coding stuff might not. So we will just take a flowchart approach and we will define the algorithm. So step one, find the S video. This involves two steps. First, we need to find a, a transpose and a transpose A. We can, the fastest algorithm for matrix multiplication. Okay, by the way, A here we are, let's assume it for uh, notation sake that it's a square matrix of n cos n. So finding A to A transpose and A transpose into A, it's just matrix multiplication which can fastest known algorithm right now can do it in this. Unless of course we are using a GPU. And we need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the same, which can be done in O of N cube. Or using a iterative method like the power method. We need to invert sigma to sigma. 
for this we just need to process the diagonal elements which are n in number in n cross f index so this is o of n and finally to find the pseudo inverse we just need to do some matrix multiplication which is as defined before the fastest known algorithm for matrix multiplication is o of n 2.4 Using a GPU, you can make this faster, but skip out right now. So the overall time complexity is the most dominating factor, which is O of n. Now, uh, this is insanely fast. Uh, at least the best time complexity for finding the inverse known right now. Uh, for reference, the only other method we did in the scores except for this is the cost Jordan elimination. It works in O of n to the power 6 and uh, can only find the inverse that is not defined for square matrices and singular matrices. So not only does the pseudo inverse give us the answer in all cases, or at least best possible answer in all cases. It also runs insanely fast compared to this. So that ends the method and algorithm side of the student verse. Hope you have no doubts and I have cleared any doubts you might have. Let's see. So finally, we are on to the significance and limitations. So significance first, as we go forward, it works in O of n cube. Works for any matrix, square or non-square, invertible or non-invertible. And it gives us the best possible solution always. Limitations. Well, computing SPD is both expensive memory-wise and time-wise. That is the most dominating factor of n cube. It's time. And for memory, you have to maintain matrices, uh, multiple of them, and you have to also solve for eigenvalues, which is pretty memory heavy. Uh, it may not always give an exact solution, but if they, but it gives the best possible solution when it can't give the exact solution. But still, nonetheless, it can't give exact solution. It's not suitable for non-linear problems. Right now, we're just dealing with AX equals to B, but you have a non-linear problem. In those cases, we can't reuse the pseudo inverse. At least not alone, the pseudo inverse. And fourth, last but not least, uh, while O of n cube is fast, some it's still pretty slow in the retrospect of things because sometimes you can just not go for an inverse and solve the li linear equation x equals to b using a linear me iterative method to give us an approximate answer like cost Jordan. So that ends our PPT. Thanks for watching and I hope I have helped you now. Thank you.